CD2. IELTS, for academic purposes. A short intensive course by Malcolm Mann and Steve Taylor Knowles. Published by McGraw Hill 2009. All rights reserved. Unit 5. Listening B. Hi, Davina. Oh, hi, Mark. How's it going? Oh, so so. I'm a bit worried about the assignment we were given last week. Have you got anywhere with it? Which one? You know, we have to come up with some good experiments to do in a science lesson with a class of 11 year olds. Oh, yes, I remember. I haven't really had time to think about it, but I'm sure we can come up with something together. Well, it's quite important, so I want to do it properly. It's a big part of our teacher training, and I don't want to mess it up. Have you had any good ideas? Well, I was trying to think back to the science lessons I had at school and see if I could remember any good experiments. There's the one where you make your own compass to explore the Earth's magnetic field. I'm not sure I remember that one. How does it work? You take a needle and rub it with a magnet to magnetize it. Then you put it on top of a bowl of water using a small piece of tissue paper. And when the tissue paper sinks, the needle floats on the water. Oh, right. Well, a compass tells you which way is north. So how does a needle do that? Because it's free to move around, it lines up with the magnetic field of the Earth and points north to south. It's pretty elementary stuff, really, but it's quite interesting. Sounds like a good start, but we might need to develop it. It doesn't sound like it's substantial enough to form a whole lesson. That's true. That's why I was having problems. I wasn't sure what else to do with it. Do you have any ideas? Um, let's see. I remember doing something in science lessons with bits of iron filings. Oh, yes. I remember that, too. Do you remember the details? I think you take a magnet and put it under a piece of card, and then you tip all these tiny bits of metal onto the card. They form curved lines around the magnet, and you can see where the magnetic field is, running from the north to the south poles. That would link in nicely with the other experiment. Yes, it would. It's still not quite enough, though. It would be good to have one more activity. Well, I've got my laptop here, and I think this place has Wi-Fi. Why don't I boot it up and we'll have a quick look online for a few ideas? Good idea. Unit 5. Listening D. Right. I'm online. Let's see. I'll type experiments with magnets into Google and see what comes up. Here we go. Try that first one. Science tips for teachers. It looks like the right kind of thing. OK. Welcome to the Science Tips for Teachers website. Choose a topic below to continue. Right. Um, magnetism. Here it is. Oh, there are lots of experiments here. We should find something. What about this one? Let me see. Yes, it sounds like the right kind of thing. I'm sure the pupils would really enjoy estimating the strength of magnets. Sounds a bit complicated, though. Well, it is if you want to build an electronic device, but there's a simpler option here. What you do is fill a small bowl with paper clips or small ball bearings. Those are those small metal balls you get inside machines. Apparently, you can buy lots of them, and it says they're very cheap. I suppose you could use anything, really, as long as it was small enough and made out of iron. Yes, I suppose so. Oh, yes, that's what it says here. OK, then what? Oh, I see. The idea is that a stronger magnet will pick up more of the objects. It must be difficult to count them, though. No, I don't think so. Not if you drop them into another container. Then you wouldn't even need to count them one by one. You could just find out the weight and compare one magnet to another. That'd be quicker. Good idea. Right. I think that's a good plan for a lesson then, isn't it? 
We've got three activities on the same subject, and each one should take about 15 minutes. I think that'll be quite fun. Can't wait to get into the classroom and actually try it out with some real live 11-year-olds. Well, we need to get our supervisor's approval first, but I agree that it sounds right. Why don't we meet later today and write some of our ideas up to present to Mr. Westwood? Okay, let's say six at my place. See you then. Unit 5, Speaking A. I'd like to tell you about a science program I saw called The World Around Us. It's a program for young people who are interested in science, and it's on a satellite channel called Science TV once a week. I don't usually enjoy watching science programs on TV, but this one looked interesting. It was about life at the bottom of the ocean, and to start with, they explained that it's very cold, and there's no light, so any animals have to be specially adapted to those conditions as a result. They showed some creatures which even produced their own light. They were actually quite beautiful. Afterwards, they followed a group of scientists who were planning to go down in a special kind of submarine and collect animals to study. It wasn't easy because they have to go so far below the surface of the water, but eventually they succeeded in collecting some fish and jellyfish. Next, they brought them to the surface in special containers that kept them at high pressure. It was amazing to see these creatures swimming around in the laboratory. In the end, they could only keep them alive for a short time, but they managed to get some great film of them. I think the main thing I learned from watching it was that there is a fantastic amount of life in places you don't normally think of, and that it can be just as fascinating as the wildlife we see around us every day. Unit 5. Pronunciation. 1. Psychology 2. Pneumonia 3. Psychiatry 4. Listen 5. Fasten 6. Soften Unit 5. Exam Practice. Listening. You'll hear two university students discussing experiments. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, Al. Sorry to interrupt you when you're having your lunch, but I wanted to ask you a favour. Oh, sure, no problem. Sit down, Josie. I've finished anyway. What do you need? Well, I was wondering if I could ask you about the experiments we were talking about in the seminar the other day with Dr Robinson. I'm doing my teaching practice on Thursday and Friday, and I'm a bit concerned about it. I wasn't entirely sure I understood them completely. If I don't understand them, then the pupils don't have any chance. You mean the ones to determine the speed of sound? Yes, that's right. Well, I think I understood the first one, but the second one was more complicated. Yes, that's true. Well, let's check what you thought of the first one, the one that you'll have to take the kids outside for. OK, let me see. Well... You need to get two groups to stand exactly 200 metres apart on the playing fields and one has a bell or a loudspeaker or some other loud sound source and a flag and the other group has a stopwatch. Yes, although it doesn't have to be 200 metres. It's just that it makes the experiment easier the more distance between them. It depends on the space available. Right, and the idea is that one group raises the flag at exactly the same moment as they make a noise and the other group starts the stopwatch when they see the flag and stops it when they hear the noise. That's it. And then you get them to do a simple calculation of velocity equals time divided by distance. Mia, yeah. it's a bit low-tech and it's not very accurate, but they should be able to get within about 20% of the actual figure if they're reasonably careful. 
Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. OK, so I understand that. It's the other one, the one with the tube I was having a few problems with. Can you just talk me through that and tell me exactly what I have to explain to the pupils? OK. Well, the thing to remember is that sound is a wave, and waves have both frequency and wavelength. You should start them off with exploring waves in water, and that'll introduce a few key concepts. Sound waves aren't exactly the same because they're compression waves, but it's more or less the same principle, at least for pupils at this level. I've got some ideas for that. So they understand wavelength and frequency, and then we move on to the experiment. For that we need, uh, let me just have a look at my notes, a long tube, a tuning fork, and a large barrel of water. Now, what do they do with those, and what's the point of it? It's fairly simple, really. You just have to remember that velocity equals wavelength times frequency. Ah, uh, yes. That's the key, isn't it? Yes. The tuning fork is manufactured to produce a sound of a given frequency. So that just leaves you one thing to measure. The pupils hit the tuning fork so that it makes a sound and hold it toward the end of the long open tube. That makes the air vibrate. They should slowly move the tube up and down. They'll find that in some positions it gets louder. That's because of resonance. What's that again? It's when there are a whole number of waves in the column of air in the tube. It makes it louder. They then measure the length of the column of air, and they can work out the wavelength from that. And that's more accurate than the other experiment? Well, it is if the pupils take an average using different tuning forks. It should be much more accurate. Thanks, Al. That's clear to me now. I can't think of any more problems. Just make sure that the pupils keep good records. You need to tell them how important that is. Any mistakes with the maths can be corrected later, but you don't want them to have to go back and get the data again. You probably wouldn't have time for that anyway. Good advice, yes. I just hope it goes well in the classroom now. Good luck. Unit 6. Listening B. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third in this introductory series of lectures on broadcast media. Last week, we discussed some of the roles involved in producing programs for broadcast, and I'll be recapping that before moving on to look at the production process as a whole, giving you an overview. The lectures for the rest of the term will then look at various aspects in more detail and consider some of the wider issues. Media production is usually a very complex process, and a number of people are involved in any program, whether for radio or TV, with the most senior figure having a direct interest being the commissioning editor. He or she will usually be responsible for putting the rest of the team together and selecting producers who may well work for an outside production company. We'll be looking at the role of outside production companies and the role they've played in changes in the broadcasting industry over the last 20 years next week. The producer or producers will work closely with the person responsible for commissioning to select directors. These might have full or associate status, depending on the number selected and the complexity of the project. These people form the core program management team and will select the creative talent, including writers and actors, as well as all the technical staff, such as editors, electricians, camera operators, makeup artists, etc. So those are the key personnel involved. Let's move on now to have a look at the production process. Unit 6. Listening D. Although the details may vary, 
the general outline of the production process will be the same, whether it's for a documentary, a soap opera, or a drama series. Other program genres may omit some stages. There's usually a minimal amount of script writing involved in producing a game show, for example, but the overall flow of tasks is very similar. It might help if you bear in mind the production of a one-off TV drama as a good example of a program that requires all stages to be done effectively. A program begins as a concept. Using their knowledge of the market and of the audience, senior figures may decide that, let's say, a new adaptation of a Dickens novel would be popular. Once this is clear and everyone responsible is satisfied that this is actually the type of work they want to produce, the work is commissioned. This involves two parallel processes. A writer is identified and work begins on a script. Once that is underway, the process of casting, selecting actors, begins. Of course, at this stage, they're working with a first draft of the script, which will go through editing a number of times, being sent back to the writer for further refinements. Once a final script is arrived at and actors have been selected, rehearsals can begin. The length of this stage may vary, depending on the complexity of the project, but it's vital since the next stage, shooting the actual footage, is the most expensive, and the last thing anyone wants to do is waste time because of a lack of preparation. Once the footage has been shot, it needs to be put into its final form. The video editing can also vary in complexity, although, of course, modern computing capabilities make this stage much more efficient than formerly. They have also had considerable effect, though, on audience expectation, so it's important not to get the impression that this stage has become easier, although perhaps it has become less routine. The program is now essentially in its broadcast form, before finally being beamed out to households across the country, though, the approval of a number of different parts of the broadcasting organization may be necessary. This can range from the original commissioning editor to senior management or even lawyers in the case of more controversial subjects. Now, does anyone have any questions about what we've covered so far today? Unit 6. Speaking A. Well, of course the media are usually considered to be a form of entertainment. I do think that they can play an educational role too, though. Take newspapers, for example. I believe that they should provide people with all the information they need to understand what's happening in the news. They should explain to people What's behind the stories? Other media, like television, are better at entertaining people, but they should be educational as well. I think this is even more important with children's programs. For example, if they make a drama for children and it contains controversial issues, they should also make other factual programs about it. That way, children can learn about the problems and be entertained at the same time. So, yes, I think the media should both entertain and educate. Unit 6. Pronunciation 1. On the one hand, some older people are confused by new media. 2. On the other hand, many older people are comfortable with new media. 3. In comparison with older people, young people tend to read blogs more often. 4. In contrast to young people, older people often prefer more traditional media. Unit 6. Exam practice. Listening. 
You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about a printing process. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. As I've made clear in earlier lectures, many different solutions have been proposed to the basic technological problem of getting meaningful marks onto paper. In other words, several different forms of printing have developed over the years, many of which are still in use today for different purposes. This week, I'd like to discuss the rotogravure process. This is one of the most widely used printing processes, and after describing how the process works, I'll be describing some of its industrial uses and the advantages and disadvantages of this form of printing. As the name implies, rotogravure is a form of printing in which large cylindrical pieces of metal rotate, while the paper to be printed passes between them. The paper is held in place against the printing surface by the impression roller. The weight of this roller is one of the factors that affect how much ink is actually transferred to the paper. Remember that this roller does not directly transfer ink onto the paper. The side in contact with the impression roller remains blank, and it's the other side of the paper which is actually the printed side. The impression roller presses the paper against the ink-bearing roller generally known as the gravure cylinder. This roller is etched or engraved using either a laser or a diamond-tipped etching machine. This creates a large number of tiny holes in the surface of the roller which hold the ink. The depth and size of these holes determines how much ink is picked up from the ink fountain, which the whole printing assembly rests in. How much ink is picked up in turn determines the density of the image produced. As it rotates, the lower roller picks up more ink on its surface than is required, and this needs to be removed before contact with the paper. A flat edge, called the doctor blade, scrapes against the surface and removes all ink which is not in one of the holes on the surface of the lower roller. This should lead to a clean image. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now that we understand a little of the mechanics of rotogravure printing, I'd like to look at it in the wider context of the printing industry and discuss the main uses. One of the main advantages of the rotogravure process is that the amount of ink which can be transferred to the paper is high compared to other printing methods. This means that a broad density range can be produced. In other words, with rotogravure, it's possible to produce many different light and dark shades, making it particularly suitable for reproducing photographs and fine art. For shorter print runs, some other processes may give a finer image, but rotogravure is ideal for jobs that involve printing, for example, a million magazines. One common place where you'll see printed matter that has been produced by rotogravure is in the advertising material that is often inserted into Sunday newspapers. Of course, it's not just paper that can be printed by rotogravure. It's a very flexible process, since the rollers used can be made to any size required. Whether it's consumer packaging or large rolls of floor covering that need to be printed, rotogravure is a relatively cheap, quick method that is used in a variety of industries. This isn't to say that rotogravure is without its disadvantages. Probably the main drawback is the fact that, with large areas of colour, the dots are visible, even without using any kind of magnifying aid. Now, 
Does anyone have any questions about the rotogravure process? Unit 7. Listening B. 1. So, I suppose we should mention something about the history of sign languages, shouldn't we? I mean, I know that's not the main focus of the presentation, but I don't think we can just ignore it, do you? No, I guess not. But we don't want to waste too much time on that. How about in the introduction, I just say that if anyone's interested in the history, we've got a brief overview in the information pack we're giving them. Yes, good idea. Let's do that. 2. Now, one of the things we'll need to get across is that sign language is much more than just moving your hands in front of your chest. The three-dimensional sign space, you mean? Yes, it's probably best for us to demonstrate that, isn't it? Yes, that could be very good, actually. You're better at signing than me, so you can demonstrate some different sentences which show how the space is used, and I'll comment on them as you do them. Fine. We'll have to write them beforehand, of course. Oh, absolutely. Three. Now... What about the differences between different sign languages? Yes, I've been thinking about that. Now, neither of us actually knows a lot about that, and there are some great clips on YouTube on the differences between British and American sign language and between American sign language and Chinese sign language. So maybe we should show them. We've got an internet connection in the seminar room, so it should be easy to do. OK. Can you get the links ready, then? You can introduce them, too, if you like. Fine. Unit 7. Listening C. One of the things I think we should cover somewhere is all the myths about sign language. What do you mean exactly? Well, you know, all the things that lots of people believe that aren't really true. You mean things like believing sign language isn't real language, that it's more like doing gestures and doesn't have any grammar, things like that? Yes, exactly. And even things like the fact that there are lots of different sign languages and signers who use American Sign Language can't really understand signers of British Sign Language or Australian Sign Language for that matter. Well, maybe that's a good place to start the whole presentation off. You say a myth, then explain that it's not true. Then I say one, then you again, and we alternate like that. Good idea. Let's make a list of all the myths we want to focus on in a minute. You just mentioned grammar, though. We're going to have to show briefly how sentences are put together, aren't we? And how things like tenses are formed. How should we do that? Well, actually, I found a great site online with loads of information about that. Maybe we could print out some of the information, photocopy it, and put it in the booklet we're going to give to everyone. When we're going through the myths at the start, we can say that we've got examples of grammatical elements in the booklet. What do you think? That sounds sensible. As long as the information we give them is clear. Oh, yes, it's great. There are loads of pictures with a simple explanation under each one. Excellent. I can't wait to see it. Now, what else? Well, you and I are going to be signing quite slowly, aren't we? I mean, we're really not very good. It would be good to make the point that expert signers sign extremely fast. I'm sure I can find a short clip on one of my DVDs that will show how fast they are. Shall we include something like that? Yes, definitely. The faster the better. One thing we should bear in mind about all the recorded clips we're going to use is that they only usually show standard sign language. I'd like to make the point that just like spoken languages, sign languages have regional variations and people sign differently sometimes depending on their educational background, how they learnt, how long they've been signing, things like that. That's a very good point. We're probably not going to find any video clips of that though, are we? But if we could find some examples in some of the books, maybe you or I could demonstrate that a bit. Yes, I'll have a look through some of the textbooks I've got and see what I can find. Great. Oh, do you know what else we should include? Fingerspelling. Oh, yes. In fact, that should be one of the myths. I think a lot of people still think that signers spell out every letter of every word. We should point out that that's not true, but then explain that, of course, there are signs for each letter, and then on the information sheets, we can include the signs for the English alphabet in some of the different sign languages. And we can encourage them to learn one of the alphabets at home. Unit 7. Speaking A. Student 1. I'm not really concerned about speaking, listening and reading, to be honest, as I think I'm quite good at them. 
and I've got good marks in the practice exams we've done, but I don't feel very confident about writing essays and descriptions. I write quite slowly and carefully, so I'm afraid I'm not going to have enough time in the exam. Student 2 Well, the main reason is that I've applied to study at a university in the UK, and they need proof that I can speak English. They accept several different qualifications, and one of them is the IELTS. As there's a school near me that prepares students for IELTS, it seemed sensible to take that exam. Student 3 There's not much I don't like, except the fact that for each listening part, you only listen once. That's difficult, and I'm not used to that. Apart from that, I think it's a good exam. Student 4 I haven't had long to get ready, only about two months. So I've been doing a short course on my own. It's not easy studying on your own, but I think I know what I have to do in the exam now. And I think my grammar and vocabulary have improved since I started. Basically, I do the exercises in the books, then I check my answers. When I get things wrong, I make sure I understand why. Unit 7 Pronunciation 1. Let's separate the phrases into two separate groups. 2. If we alternate, we'll make an alternate point each. 3. When you approximate, you work out the approximate number. 4. Who's going to be present when I present the findings? 5. If you perfect something, you make it perfect. Unit 7. Exam practice. Listening. You'll hear two university students planning a computer programming lesson. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi, Hardeep. Is now a good time for us to plan that computer programming lesson we've been assigned? Hey, Don. I was just thinking about that, actually. Yes, let's get it out of the way now, shall we? I've got the instructions here. So, it says, Design a 45-minute lesson for a class of 16 teenagers where they learn how to write a simple computer program in BASIC. Now, I know, of course, that BASIC is the computer language people used to use back in the 1980s when they wrote programs on microcomputers, but I'm not sure I feel very comfortable teaching anyone about it. Well, I did a bit of research yesterday and found out quite a few things, so I think we'll be okay. Great. So, what do you have in mind? Well, I think we should presume that none of the kids will know anything about BASIC. So why don't we start with a short multiple choice quiz? It could focus on things like what BASIC is, what the letters stand for, when people used it, things like that. That sounds good. I guess it shouldn't take long. Just the first five minutes of the lesson, something like that. I don't think we should make the students do it on their own, though. That'd make it too much like a test. Shall we let them do it in two so they can discuss their choices? Yes, good idea. Then we'll go through the answers with them as a whole group. Good. What next? Well, I've had an idea for the program they could write. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I think the key thing is, though, that before they actually sit at their computers, and I think we should presume that they're doing this lesson in a computer room, they make a flow chart of what they want the program to do. That's usually the best way to start writing a program. This flow chart will show all the different stages of the computer program, right? Exactly. 
it's probably best if the teacher stands at the board and everyone works on that together. Yes, otherwise they'll all come up with different flow charts and it'll get confusing. Precisely. I imagine making the flow chart will take about 15 to 20 minutes. Then they use that to write their computer program. Well, actually, I think there's a stage before that. You see, the flow chart will be in English. They're going to need to be taught a few basic commands so they can write their computer program. Hmm. Now I'm getting out of my depth. What kind of thing would that be? Well, for example, when you want text to appear on the screen, the command is print in capital letters, followed by the text you want to appear in double inverted commas. Oh, yes. I think I've seen that before. Right. So they'll need to be taught five or six commands before they use them to write their program. Okay. So how shall we do that? With the teacher talking to the whole class again? Well, we could, but it might be more fun to make it more like a competition, where there are a few teams competing against each other. Each team has maybe four or five people in it, and they have to do some kind of matching task. You know, they match the command print with to make text appear on the screen, something like that. That sounds good. Teenagers love competing with each other. Exactly. And then, for the final part of the lesson, they use their flowchart and the commands they've learned to produce the program. Let's presume, shall we, that there are eight computers in the room, so that's two students for each computer. That sounds reasonable. So, tell me more about your idea for the computer program they're going to write. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. OK, so it's a very simple program. I've actually written it down here so we can go through it together. OK, so the first line says 10 CLS. What on earth does that mean? Well, every line of a basic computer program starts with a number. They usually go up in tens. So the first line is 10, the second 20, and so on. And CLS is the command we use in BASIC to clear the screen. Oh, I see. So that's just telling the computer to start with a blank screen. Exactly. Then we move on to the next line. So this one says, 20, print, guess a number between 1 and 10. Right, I see. That appears on the screen. It's not that difficult, is it, when you get the hang of it? Let's see if I can work out the next one. 30, input I. Oh, not sure about that. Well, all that's saying is that the person playing types in a number. Input is the basic command for type in, and I just means any number you like. Oh, OK. Then what happens next depends on what the number is. So we've got 40 if I is less than 1, or if I is greater than 10. Then print, bad choice. Right, so if they type, say, 0 or 11, that appears on the screen. Exactly. And then this next line takes them back to where it asks them to type in a number between 1 and 10. That's line 50. I see. And line 60 says, if I equals 6, then print. Correct. Ah, OK. So if they've typed 6, they've got it right. And if they haven't typed 6, which is the next line, then try again comes up on the screen, and that takes them back to where they choose another number. It's clever. Well done. Unit 8. Listening A. Most people know him as the greatest writer in the English language. Many even consider him to be the greatest dramatist the world has ever seen. We are, of course, talking about Shakespeare. 
And today, we're going to start by looking at some of the myths that surround the life and works of William Shakespeare. One myth is that Shakespeare was born on and died on the same date, the 23rd of April, or St George's Day. Well, yes, we do know for sure when he died, the 23rd of April, 1616. We don't know for certain, however, when he was born. This myth can be traced back to an 18th century writer who mistakenly wrote that Shakespeare's birthday was April the 23rd. Perhaps it was, but there's really no proof. What we do know was that he was born in Stratford-upon-Avon, the son of John Shakespeare and Mary Arden, a fairly wealthy couple, in 1564, and that he was christened, or baptised, on the 26th of April. Was he three days old, or three weeks old when he was christened? The truth is, we don't know, and probably never will. Unit 8. Listening B. We do know for certain when Shakespeare got married. That was on the 27th of November, 1582. He was 18, and his wife, Anne Hathaway, was 26. Six months later, she gave birth to a daughter, Susanna, and about two years after that to twins, a boy called Hamnet and a girl, Judith. When he was 11 in 1596, Hamnet sadly died of unknown causes. Now, of course, there's the well-known myth that it was grief over Hamnet's death that led Shakespeare to write the play Hamlet. In fact, academic opinion is divided on this. Some academics argue that there's really no connection between the two names. Others argue that, at the time, Hamlet and Hamnet were considered to be the same name. Once again, we may well never learn the truth. Unit 8. Listening C. The twins, Hamnet and Judith, were born in 1585. And it wasn't until 1592 that Shakespeare began to be mentioned in connection with the London theatre world. The years in between are often referred to as his lost years, as very little is known about where he went and what he did. There are many myths about that period. One says that Shakespeare had to escape from Stratford because he'd been caught doing something illegal, in fact, poaching, and was about to be prosecuted. Another says that his first job in London connected to the theatre was looking after the horses of wealthy theatre-goers. Another myth says that he taught at a school, they may be true, but they may not. All we really know is that Shakespeare did indeed move from Stratford to London, and over hundreds of years people have suggested these theories as to why, but there's no strong evidence to support any of them. Because he's so respected today, it's easy to forget that not everyone has always considered Shakespeare to be great. Indeed, as you'll recall, we said that it was in 1592 that Shakespeare is first mentioned in relation to his career as a playwright. This wasn't a glowing review of one of his plays, though. On the contrary, it was a vicious attack by the playwright Robert Greene, who accused Shakespeare of arrogance in thinking he could write plays as well as university-educated playwrights such as Christopher Marlowe and Robert Greene himself. Because, of course, Shakespeare never went to university, and his success was bound to upset people who did. And for Green to condemn Shakespeare like that means that by 1592, Shakespeare had already found success. Green wouldn't have wasted his time attacking someone no one had heard of. Unit 8. Speaking A. The person from history I admire the most is Gandhi. When he was living in South America, or rather South Africa, he was working as a lawyer and he helped the poor. In 1815, I mean 1915, he moved to India and he continued his work helping people there. The thing I admire most about him 
is that he was completely opposed to all forms of violence. He showed people that you can achieve a lot by peaceful means, and he helped his country at a difficult time when he was being ruled by the French, uh, the British, I should say. Unit 8, Pronunciation 1. History Historic Historical 2. Economy Economic Economical 3. Photograph Photographic Photographer 4. Scientific Scientist Scientifically Unit 8 Exam Practice Listening You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about the museum service. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good afternoon. So far in these lectures, we've been looking at the management of public services and the ways in which they try to improve. Today, I want to look at the museum service, since it's a very good example of the kind of service that everyone says they want, in theory, but which in practice often has to work with limited budgets. The key aim of most museums today is to make themselves more effective. In the past, a museum might simply collect and organize old objects and display them in glass cabinets. Often, these displays didn't change from one year to the next and simply got bigger as the museum bought more exhibits. However, falling numbers of visits to museums taught managers that bigger wasn't necessarily better and that museums had to adapt to deal with a changing world. Museums have learned that they need to offer a greater variety of services for people in their local area to choose between. They also need to reach as wide an audience as possible and need to find innovative ways of getting people through the door who we perhaps wouldn't think of as traditional museum visitors, children, for example, or people from various ethnic backgrounds. Museum managers often don't have the funding to do very much about the buildings they manage, but they can do a lot about the experience of visiting those buildings. A lot depends on the staff, of course, however big or small the team running the museum may be. But there are also relationships outside the museum which have a large effect. Rather than work alone, good museums these days work very closely with local councils and businesses. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. These relationships can be quite complicated, and it's important to understand the different responsibilities. Most museums find that there are things that are the direct responsibility of staff, such as planning and designing new public displays, and there are things that they need outside help for. I'd like to go on to consider some of these areas. Museums have for a long time complained of a lack of funding. They are often not at the top of the list when it comes to local councils deciding what to do with their money. This has led to museums seeking alternative sources, 
and the local business community has been a valuable partner. More often than not these days, you'll see that an exhibition is sponsored by a business that has some connection to the subject. Their logo will appear on any promotional material that the museum produces to advertise its events, such as leaflets and ads in the local press. Museums also can't afford to see themselves in isolation from the local community, and that obviously involves knowing exactly who the local community is. In most museums, the staff themselves will come from the town or city where the museum is located and should have some knowledge of the needs of local people. However, they will usually rely heavily on studies done by the local council, which tell them what people want from their museum service. Once they have that information, it's then up to the staff to decide how they're going to get the people of the area more involved in the museum, either as visitors or even possibly as volunteers. Apart from the exhibitions, museums provide a whole range of activities, including things like talks or workshops on subjects that local people may be interested in. The museum staff probably lack the expertise to talk on many subjects, and so it usually means inviting speakers from different places, possibly even from different countries. This is exactly the kind of thing that museums will try to do in partnership with companies from the local area, who are often willing to pay for speakers if their brand name is displayed at the event. Museums, of course, need various well-maintained buildings. It's important that people can access the museum services easily and comfortably, and it will usually be the local authorities who are responsible for that. This funding is, of course, ultimately provided by local people through their taxes. So... End of CD2